Anything in your minds? Anything else you're thinking about? Yeah. Is that a hand? No. Anything else? Okay. Um, if you haven't already, uh, please sign into the attendance. I don't, I don't have to remind you every day. I'm sorry? Okay. All right. And let's take a look at a poll question uh, to start, if we can. Okay. Uh, this is one of those questions that does not have a right or wrong answer. But uh, it's a good way to start thinking about today's class. So the question for you all to think about is this. Is your body propping up? Uh, is your body property? True or false? Okay. Professor Josh Blackman, constitutional law professor. Okay. All right. Another 10 seconds or so. All right. Let's just see the results, how, uh, how all of you voted. Hmm. Okay. So about 72% of you, so about three quarters of the class, so that your body is property. And about 27%, about a quarter of the class, said your body is not property. All right. Um, where did I leave off last class? Me. OK, Heather, you next? Uh, I was my OK, Clayton. Clayton, what did you put over here? I said yes. All right, well, let me ask you a follow-up question, Clayton. How do you define the term property? That's the question. I mean, what, what is property? That's my question for you. Something that is in possession of an individual. Okay. So how is your body property? Is it something you possess? Well, I, I was thinking about it in terms of like being able to donate organs. Mm -hmm. I have to give to someone to begin with, therefore they are mine. Okay, so you can donate your organs. Can you sell them? Uh, not here, someplace. <laughs> <laughs> not here, okay. Tim, let me ask you the same question. What is property? Um, I mean, I like the, the definition that the governor of Dominion and control over Okay. And usually what can you do with property? Um, sell it. Can you sell a person? Can you sell part of a person? let someone else use your person yeah. for money? Yeah. I'm going with this, right? This is not an easy question. Um, I don't pretend it's going to be easy. Um, uh, uh, Giancarlo. Giancarlo, what'd you put here, true or false? Yes, is, body, is your body property? I think it's property. Okay, why do you think it's property? Because I think there's, I think there's a marketplace or something that probably would fall under something is there a marketplace for bodies? Body parts. Oh, that's gruesome, isn't it? <laughs> that, that's kind of gross. Who are you putting? No. Oh, you're next. Oh, that's perfect. I was getting nervous. I had like five hundred yeses. I wanted someone. OK, Baron, OK, you're perfect. You, you tell me why you put no here.
Can you put harmful materials into your body? Can you drink? Can you smoke? Can you, uh, in some states, can you use the controlled substances of marijuana? So, this question has a lot of dimensions, and I want to just, I think five or six people here have hit on a few high points here, right? This class is almost backwards. We are now in, what, week three, and we haven't actually defined what property is. All the cases that we've done so far are saying, how do you get property? You can hunt it, right? You can conquer it. You can discover it. Um, you can uh, create it. You can invent it. But we never actually said, what is property? And actually, this class, and maybe the class after, and then the class after that will discuss this. But property should not be thought of as a single entity, right? It's not just this is property. Um, we try to think of property as different elements, right? And I'll give you an easy example. Someone's an organ donation, right? If any of you want to donate a kidney, you can do it. A person can live with one kidney. It's not I mean, you know, maybe there might be health concerns, but you can live with a kidney. You can't sell it, though, right? Yeah, Douglas? They can be, yeah. Well, usually you donate your body, but sometimes they're sold on not so legal means. But you can't usually sell organ uh, grave robbers. I'm talking about right, but but generally you donate them for science, for 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 for, for the good of mankind, not for money, right? Your state doesn't get a check after you donate your body. But let me let me finish the point I was making, right? We have certain types of property that you can give, but you can't sell. I'll give you another example, your law degree, right? In a couple years, you all get a little piece of paper, it's this beautiful piece of paper, you put a frame on your wall that says you graduated from the law school. You paid a lot of money for that piece of paper. Could you sell that to someone else and make them a, a JD? No, you can't convey that, even though it's this little piece of paper. I mean, you could, you could sell it, but it won't have no actual effect. All right, but in some regards, your body might be considered property. How so? Well, the state does limit what you can do with your body. There are certain things that exist, drugs, that the state says you cannot put inside your body. Even if you want to, even if you're fully consensual, you're an adult, you're of sound mind, and you want to take fentanyl, whatever, whatever, whatever you want to do. I picked the most egregious one I could think of, yeah. right? <laughs> do you want to put fentanyl in your body? I, okay. Um, the state says, no, you can't do that. Um, and let's talk about sex, maybe, right? <laughs> uh, you can have sex, but if money's attached to it, it's illegal. And there are a lot of very great lines about what it means to pay for sex. And there, don't, don't, there are cases about whether you're actually paying for the sex or for the dinner, right? That, that's an actual, that's an actual defense. Oh, I wasn't paying for sex. I was paying for the, I was paying for dinner, right? Um, why is it that certain types of prostitution? oldest profession, we're after lawyers, I guess. Why can that be criminalized? Um, precisely because the state considers your body something that can't be violated for improper purposes. And then I think uh, Mackenzie mentioned slavery, right? If a body, a person, a living, not a cadaver, not a cadaver, Douglas, a living human being is a property, can it be sold, right? Can it be bought? Can it be conquered? Like with the Johnson case, right? Once you start talking about the body in these sorts of ways, this 75-25 split, I think it's a little bit more messy. In fact, if I were to poll you again, I think maybe the numbers would shift a little bit. I've done before, they do, they do shift, take my word for it. Um, the bottom line is, I don't have a single definition of property to give you. And if you start understanding the different ways property works, this is fuzzy, right? One way to think about property is a, um, a metaphor, which we'll cover a lot in this class. Um, it's called the bundle of sticks. The bundle of sticks. I think the uh, California case called it a bundle of rights. You might have seen that phrase. It's the same thing, right? What does it mean, a bundle of sticks? Don't think of a property as a single block. It's different elements. So for example, maybe one of the sticks in the bundle, this little red one, is the right to sell. Right? And maybe the 
black one is just the right to possess it. Right? Because you remember in the Indian case, they could, they could possess the land, but they couldn't sell it. And then maybe the, this blue stick over here is the right to exclude. That is the right to keep people off your land. The Indians could possess it, but they couldn't sell it, and they couldn't keep people off their property, right? So rather than just saying the Indians own the land, that's not precise. You say they have the right to possess, but not the right to exclude, and they do not have the right to sell. Everyone getting anything so far? Each of these sticks in the bundle are separate, and you can have one, not the other. I'll give you an example. I'm sure a lot of you are renting apartments, right? You have a lease, right? Leasing an apartment. Can you possess it? Sure, you can possess it for a period of one year or two years, whatever your lease is. Can you sell it? No way, you can't sell it. Can you exclude people? I think you can during your one year leasehold. It's yours and you, you can keep uh, uh, trespassers off, call the cops, whatever you need to do, right? Even in your limited capacity as a renter, you have some rights but others. Now maybe you buy a house. You own that house and you can then sell it to someone else. So then you have the full bundle of sticks, right? So when I say the full bundle of sticks, I mean you can buy it, you can sell it, you can keep people out, maybe you can rent it out, you can do whatever you want to the land. But for a lot of people, they have less than the full bundle of sticks. That's something shorter, you know, maybe a one-year leasehold or something like that, right? And maybe you can think of the body in that capacity. We can do some stuff to our body, but we can't do everything to our body. In other words, under our system of government, we don't own our bodies in their entirety. There are some things we can do to it, and there are some things we can't do to it, right? I can't put fentanyl in my body. The government, I mean, I guess I can, but the government will punish me if they find I'm putting fentanyl in my body, right? I'm going to not use a pronoun here, but a person can't sell himself for sex, right? That's against the law. The government can arrest you for selling your body for sex, right? Slavery. Slavery is unconstitutional. In fact, the, the, the U.S. Constitution doesn't do very much to regulate private conduct. Generally, the Constitution regulates governmental conduct. One of the very few exceptions, maybe one or two in the Constitution, is slavery. Right? If a person holds a slave, that's not just against statutory law. That's unconstitutional. It violates the 13th Amendment of the Constitution. Right? So we have a law saying you cannot own a slave. Indeed, a person can't sell himself into slavery. We might call an endangered servant, right? Even if you wanted to put yourself into bondage, you can't. That's illegal in our in our republic. So the body isn't this like you know, we're standing here, we're all alive, healthy, thank God. But in terms of property, there are different strands, different sticks in the bundle. And when I ask you to describe something in property class, you need to describe it in these terms, right? If I say you know, is your body property? You say well, you know, you can't buy or sell it, but maybe you can give away organs that won't kill you. Uh, and maybe you can put some substances in your body, alcohol, tobacco, but you can't put other substances, fentanyl, right? Uh, maybe you can have consensual relations, but you can have cons consent relations for cash, right? There are different gradations. Let me give you one more, uh, a second. When I ask you who owns something, right? That's a very imprecise question, right? If you say, oh, Josh owns this marker, right? Josh owns this, this, this computer, this camera doesn't actually work right now, right? Uh, what I'm actually asking is, what is Josh's relationship to the camera, right? He can sell it, he can give it away for free, he can exclude people from using it, that they can't trespass, they can't take it, that'd be conversion, right? So whenever I, in this class, I ask you something like, who owns X? It should be not just a one sentence answer, yes or no, it should be, can you buy it? Can you sell it? Can you exclude? Right? What are your different attributes of ownership? And that's going to get you thinking about our next topic, right? What does it mean to own property? We will spend, my God, probably half the semester on defining what it means to own property. Own property in the present, and maybe you own property in the future. That is, you have a present interest in some property, you own it now, or you might have some sort of future interest. Maybe you own it in the future if something happens. Right? These are all ways of describing the relationship between a person and a piece of property. The word own, O-W-N, is so loaded. There's so many different ways to own something. And that's the bulk of what this semester is. Everyone get that? Okay, so the bundle of sticks. I actually have a, I forgot it, Sarah's. I have a thing like a pixie, uh, no, what are they all the pickup sticks, right? With the little bundle, but I forgot it. So markers are my plan B. Okay, patiently waiting, John Carl. Um, I was just wondering, how do you, how do you draw the line with, let's say you have a kidney, you can't sell it, but you can sell, I mean, you can buy, sell, exclude it from something like your own blood, 
Okay, so I won't ask, but I'm sure many of you have sold plasma before. In college towns, they always have plasma banks because it's, it's easy money. I'm, I'm not choking. I'm not going to ask, but I see people nodding. Um, and it's not even the blood. It's the plasma that actually generates the cash. I mean, people can donate sperm. right? They can donate eggs. Um, you can donate sperm. Uh, a bone marrow, and that's that's not an easy procedure. That's actually a very invasive procedure to extract the bone marrow, but you can donate it. You can't donate your heart. Um, you can't donate, right, your brain. I guess you can after death. And if you have your little organ thing checking your driver's license, your donor, that's a different story. Now, but you 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 can donate a kidney. They can't pay you for a donation of a kidney, but you can get paid for donating. Plasma, blood, uh, semen, and eggs, right? Do you know why? Yeah. Bingo. Right. Um, blood, plasma, semen, uh, um, uh, bone marrow regenerates, right? If you take some of your body, your body will, if everything works right, make new plasma. Uh, you don't grow a second kidney, right? You can't, re we're not chameleons, we can't regenerate organs. So the law draws a, a line, it's actually a very distinct line. That is, you can receive compensation for body parts that regenerate, but you cannot receive compensation for body parts that will not regenerate. Right? They only pay you for stuff that you'll get regeneration. And again, so even the, this right to sell is conditional. You can't sell anything in your body. You can only sell those things that regenerate. And that's a decision the state has made over many years and decades over uh, 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 how a person should use their body. It's a good question. Anyone else? Yeah, Ricardo. What about like a, a woman, like in essence, like leasing out her body? A surrogate. Very, yeah, a surrogate. Look, women get paid for that, right? So wouldn't that also be considered like, I don't want to say analogous, but like prostitution, but uh, well, I thought you were going in a different direction. I thought you were going to slavery, uh, but 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 uh, it, it's consensual in that it's a person willing. But some people argue that, yeah, that that even allowing surrogacy is a form of indentured servitude, at least for the nine months of the of the of the term. Um, that that some people do make that argument. Um, but let me address the other part. Uh, these are all gray areas. Right? I don't, I don't, this is not a class of morality. I don't pretend to have answers for you, but these are all gray areas. Yeah, Chance? When a woman sells an uh, embryo, is it, that doesn't regenerate, but... Yeah, so, so technically uh, eggs don't regenerate, but the quantity of them is so significant that I, I'm going to get myself in trouble, but generally there's enough, there, there are more of them. It, it, but it is a fixed number. It's not something that, that you... Make new ones. I feel like I'm in sex ed right now. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. With the onset of stem cells, what are your thoughts on right now we can't regenerate, but in the future if we can, what's, is there a loop on that? I have no idea. Again, I these questions are way beyond my pay grade. Uh, <laughs> I feel inadequate to answer them, but but I don't know. Yes. Um, what about rewards for people with this disease? Like gift cards and stuff? Yeah, there's some regimes where you can give like you know like a gift card or like a raffle or stuff, but um, generally you can't pay the market value. Wait, no, no. I'm talking about like when people are in need of a liver and they advertise it and they say it's a reward or a compensation. For I it. don't think that's allowed. So is it gonna be a <laughs> donation and then just? That's like I was paying for the dinner, not for the sex. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, you may you may see that it's it's not it's not kosher. You know that's not supposed to. There, there's a law called the National Organ Transplant Act, NODA, which puts limits on these sorts of things. Um, yeah, the, the, these are all gray issues. Yeah, Blake. It kind of came up with the surrogacy. Like I would look at that as a service, and we talk about how we can't sell ourselves into slavery and sell other people into slavery. Yeah. But do we read any cases or touch on the fact that? sell ourselves to employment and where <laughs> says a future lawyer right look look wow we're going deep now um, 
Uh, Doesn't get touched on somewhere eventually? Or just all right, so in Kama, not in this class, there are cases of whether the draft, the military draft, violates the 13th Amendment as a form of slavery. Uh, the courts rejected it, and I'm not sure if those opinions are right or wrong, um, but generally employment that you voluntarily enter into is not considered slavery, although by definition, you can walk away. You can quit your job, right? There's no, there's no legal consequence for quitting your job. There might be financial consequences, but you can walk away from the job, right? And danger and servitude would be if you actually leave your job before your terms up, you would be arrested for violating the contract, and those sorts of laws are not valid. Right, but if you walk away, they can sue you for damages. They can't force you back into the job. That's the difference, right? If you have a contract to work for a period of time and you fail to, they can sue you for breach of damages. They cannot issue specific performance to make you do the job, which is why specific performance is so rare, right? You're basically forcing someone to engage in an act. Uh, I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. But, 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 but look, did you study in torts the Good Samaritan laws? I think that's a form of indentured servitude. It's forcing you to take on a duty of care. Um, I, there, are, there are regimes that make you do stuff that you don't want to do, and generally I think that's, a, that's not a good idea. I don't want to watch someone dying in the swimming pool, but I shouldn't be forced to do it if I don't want to. This way, I will never be a tort professor. This is not the right thing to say. <laughs> Let him drown, right? I can't really swim anyway, but you know, I, I think I would actually be the guy who tries to help them and actually makes it worse and them liable. I'd be that guy. So I'd be like, okay. I knew this question would, would, would foster a good discussion. Again, I, I don't want you to think there's a right or an easy answer to these sorts of questions. There aren't. Um, but if there are debates like this, the question can pose is, which branch of government is in the best position to resolve these? Right? The judiciary or the legislature? I think all too often, lawsuits think, oh, the courts can resolve every issue. And I'm not so sure. I am not so sure. These are hard ethical questions. There are 70 something of you here and they probably have 75 different opinions. People can consult their faith, consult their ethics, consult their values, consult their elders. Whoever you want to ask, you get different opinions versus having five unelected, well, in California they're elected, but five judges uh, are rendering these decisions. These are, these, are, these are weighty issues. Okay, what else? All right, let's actually do the case. Did I do the middle section already? So I, I think over there, I'm um, sorry, what's your name? I don't see your name tag. You did. Sarah? Sarah, my friend. Okay, back up top. Okay, Sarah. Uh, do you want to start off and give me the facts in um, our case today? Only one case. Um, uh, Moore versus Regents of the University of California, please. So basically, Moore, the plaintiff, was getting treatment at UCLA for his double sternia. And while he was getting treatment, the physician told him that he had to get his spleen removed. Yeah. And By the way, does everyone know what a spleen is? Okay, um, a spleen is a body part that people don't really know what it is. Um, it's basically a filter for blood. It's part of your immune system. Um, I Googled this, so I'm not making this up. Um, when you have old red blood cells, they recycle in the spleen, and certain white blood cells are stored there. And the spleen helps fight bacteria. Um, you can live without it. It's not like an essential organ, but it helps keep stuff filtered. All right, that, that's what a spleen is. All right, go on, sir. Well, well, how what was wrong with the spleen? Did the, the facts discuss that a little bit? Okay, so let me let me give you some background. Um, th there's, there's this is a this is a case with a very lo long background. Uh, so Mr. Moore was working on Alaska pipeline, which is not easy work. That's that's hard work. Uh, and he started getting these symptoms. His gums started to bleed. His belly swelled up. And bruises began to cover his body, all over his body. He was freaking out. He thought he was dying. The guy was 31 years old. Right, what's going on? Um, so he went to treatment in California, in Los Angeles. And at the hospital, they made him sign a consent form. Okay. And Jasmine, what did that consent form say? What did the consent form actually say? Oh, what? consenting to the spleen. Right, and what were they going to do with the spleen when they were done with it? 
What was the hospital? What did the hospital say they're gonna? I mean, generally, Jasmine, when you go to a hospital, you're getting something removed. What What do you think you're gonna do to it? Throw it away. Yeah. Right. You know, it's like when you go to a mechanic and they swap out a part. You say, "Give me the old parts back to make sure they actually didn't put the old parts in there." Right. When you go to a doctor to have an organ removed, they don't usually give it to you, right, in like a Ziploc bag, right? Um, the reason why is it's called medical waste, right? It's actually hazardous to have this stuff floating around. Okay, so he went to the hospital and he signed a consent form. And the consent form said that the hospital could dispose of any severed tissue or member by cremation. Right, that, that's standard. Okay. And they took the spleen out. Um, generally, a spleen weighs about a pound. His spleen weighed 22 pounds. So I'm like, this thing was, was, was huge, right? I mean, I don't know what it looks like, but it's probably a very big spleen, right? I don't know. It's probably went to law school, not med school. I don't know. Um, then he flew back to Seattle and became an oyster salesman, which, again, is, is, is not easy work. Over the next seven years, he would fly from Seattle uh, uh, to Los Angeles. I'm sorry. He, he, he would go to Seattle. And he would take follow-up exams. But he had to keep going to Los Angeles to take certain samples. They would take bone marrow, blood, and semen. And Moore said, you know, I wonder, right, why I have to keep coming back to Los Angeles. So then the doctor said, okay, tell you what. We'll pay for tickets to fly you here. And they put him up at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, which is like a very famous hotel. Is that the Merv Griffin Hotel? You know Merv Griffin is? Anyway, this, it was a very famous hotel. What Mr. Moore didn't know is that the doctor, Dr. Gold, filed a patent on his cells. Now, let me explain how this works, right? Um, most people, most people, when you take their cells out of their body, they stop regenerating, right? If I were to take some blood from your body, I'm not going to do that, I promise, right? Pound of flesh, right? I'm not going to take your blood. Your cells die. But there's some people whose cells are unique in that they continue to regenerate outside the body, right? If there are cells in your body, they regenerate all the time. Once you take them out, they stop. But there's some people who have magical cells, and I don't even want to try to explain to you why this works. But you basically put their cells in a dish, and the cells keep replicating, right? So let's say you just take out like a, a couple cells. That can turn into a million cells over time as they regenerate. They split in half, split in half. And these cells are used for various forms of research, right? Rather than having to go to a person and keep extracting cells, you can just let this one line regenerate and regenerate and regenerate, spits out lines. Gold actually was able to get a patent on this cell line, which regenerated. And it was sold for millions, but now it could be worth billions. Um, did anyone read this book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks? Troy, you want to tell us what it's about? Oh, no, sorry. Do you remember? Yeah, it was for uh, an African-American woman that was at the hospital and got monster sick, and then when she later found out that her cells were ripped off her, her cells were missing, body cells possibly were rendered, and then they were on, you know, mucus was still on them, so she was probably just sick. Um, but they didn't pay her for it, and then she was like, wasn't it, I'm not sure how old it was, but wasn't it old? No, it was early 20th century. Okay, like old, oh, old, oh, old oh, Like that, and then, um, yeah. Chance for the hand up also? Okay, right, this is a good book. Um, I don't recommend books often, but this is actually a very good book. Um, Henrietta Lacks was a, was a poor black woman living in Baltimore, and she went to the Johns Hopkins Hospital for some treatment for cancer, um, and they did some work on her. They actually helped, uh, uh, with, helped her with her symptoms. Um, they took some of her cells, and they just put them in a, peach, in, a, in a petri dish, a little round dish. And they just observed that they started to grow. They didn't expect it, right? But they started growing. And they started getting more cells from her and more cells from her. She eventually died. But they never told her that this was valuable. In fact, they named the cell line, you see the title H-E-L-A, it's bolded, HeLa, after Henrietta Lacks. They didn't even use her name. It's called a HeLa. And this one they called M-O, like more. They don't take the guy's name, they just put the first couple letters, right? And these cells save lives, right? They, they were able to develop a lot of treatments based on them. Uh, but the Lax family didn't get a penny of it. Um, eventually, a reporter, the author of this book, her name was uh, Rebecca Skloot. Yeah, Rebecca Skloot. 
um, track down the uh, descendants of Henrietta. She had a couple kids and explain to them what happens. And it's, it's a really good story. I don't want to give it away. But eventually, the hospital gives credit to the family. Um, and they, they adopt policies to prevent for this from happening again. Uh, did the family get the billions of dollars? They did not. Uh, but they at least reached some sort of agreement that this won't happen again. Uh, but that, this was done pff, the last five years, so fairly recent. But this case is going on in the 80s. All right, so fl flashback to the 80s. Uh, and you know, every now and then, Moore's flying to Los Angeles, and he's giving up his cells. But at some point, they give him a new consent form. Right, Catherine, what does this new consent form say? It's a little bit different. Well, what 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 did the consent form say? What was he consenting to? To give a revised consent form that that that, that was at issue in this case. The first consent form just said we can dispose of this stuff for you. What did the other consent form say? What were they asking to consent to? Do you need to read it? Yeah. They gave him a new consent form that said, I grant to the University of California all the rights I or my heirs may have in the cell line. And I grant whatever rights any product might develop from my bone, uh, from my blood cells. In other words, he's not only consenting to the um, uh, to the disposal of the, you know, the, the medical waste. He's consenting to the using of this information for profit, and he's giving up all rights to it. Now, when Moore got this new form, he was already suspicious. He said, why are they flying this poor oyster salesman to the Beverly Hills Wilshire Hotel, right? What's going on here, right? And he figured they were probably doing something he didn't know exactly what. But then he gets this new form asking them to give up, you know, commercial value. So Moore says, I don't want to rock the boat, right? I was worried that if I didn't sign this, the guy would cut me off. So what did he just do? He just circled, I don't consent. And he, he didn't say anything. And then the doctor called and said, hey, you circled the wrong thing. Must be accident. Please come back. <laughs> and Moore goes, I don't know how I made that mistake. And then he flew back home to Seattle. Then the doctor mailed the form to him and told him to circle the, the, I do, uh, the I do one. And then he didn't. And the doctor sent another letter saying, stop being a pain, sign the damn form. And then what did Mr. Moore respond with? Lawyer. Oh. Right, that's when things get like, you know, conflict. What Moore found out is that for the last seven years, Gold had developed a cell line called MO, M-O, for Moore. And these cell lines were very valuable. They produce proteins that can be used to treat infections and cancer. Right? This is very valuable stuff. Right? People's lives were saved because of more cells. I'm sure more will say, that's great. Pay me for it. Right? Give me a cut. Give me a cut, and I'd be happy to let you use my cell lines forever, wherever that cut happens to be. Um, uh, where am I up to? Uh, is that uh, Monique? Monique, at the time, did California have any statutes, any laws governing um, governing uh, 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 property rights or, or, or royalties that can be derived from the sale of these cells? No. No. What kind of laws did California actually have on, on the books at this time? How did the state generally treat organs that were outside the body and cells? What did they view it as? Abandoned yeah, waste. Property. Abandoned waste, yeah. The only issues, the only laws that govern these uh, cells were how to dispose of them, right? Because they were not viewed as valuable, right? So Mr. Moore didn't go to the California legislature to get a bill passed. In fact, such a bill would have been, I think, unhelpful because it would have been enacted after the cells were extracted. Instead, he went to the courts. 
And I know law students think that all re all conflicts resolved in the courts. I'm not so sure about that. I think courts screw stuff up. Courts screw stuff up quite a bit, especially on very difficult judgment calls. Um, sometimes it's better to have no resolution than a bad resolution. But law students always agree when I say that. So Chelsea, let me ask you this question, please. What were the two claims that Mr. Moore made uh, uh, in court? The two bi main ones. Conversion uh -huh. and breach of fiduciary duty. Okay, let's talk about the first one first. Breach of fiduciary duty. What 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 does that mean? Basically, the doctor has a duty to disclose to the patient that he has other like ulterior interests and motives uh, in his treating him. Okay, that's right. Uh, the word fiduciary is used in a lot of contexts. Usually, you think of fiduciary in the financial context, maybe the financial advisor. But also as attorneys, you all, God willing, be lawyers soon, you have a fiduciary duty to your clients. What does a fiduciary duty entail? Um, honesty, fair dealings, candor. You can't uh, uh, hold stuff in. You can't give false information, right? In other words, if you have a client and you want to do something, you have to tell them what you're doing. You can't give them false reasons. You can't lie about it. Failure to follow this fiduciary duty can result in what we call legal malpractice. Right, where you can sue a person for violating these duties. So he basically sued the doctor, more sued the doctor for violating this fiduciary duty in that he didn't tell him what he was using the information for, right? He had this generic form about disposing of body parts for garbage, but they didn't tell them you're making billions of dollars off his blood, right? I am not so concerned about the fiduciary duty thing. That's more of a tort or contract matter. That's, that's not gonna keep me up at night, right? What I want to talk about is the other claim, Akinza, the conversion claim. So you don't have to stand up. What's conversion? You can say seated, I'm sure. I, first, first time I started teaching, I asked a question, and the students are like, why are you standing up? What are you doing? I didn't know. Now I know. I, I, I never had that in law school. I never had to stand up. But anyway, Akinza, what's conversion? Basically having dominion and possession over Okay, over someone else's property, right? Thank you. All right, so conversion is generally a tort in which you take possession of someone else's property. And to be precise, this is personal property, right? Personal property, like this, you know, this, this thing, whatever this thing is, right? If I, if I trespass onto your land, right, you're, that's real property. You don't think of that as conversion. We think of conversion as, you know, you take my, my camera or whatever else, okay? This is the question, though. Conversion only works if you're having ownership of someone else's property. If it's not property, you can't convert it. So this case turns on the very question I put up on the board at the start of class. What is property? Right? I ask you, is your body property? And I think when I ask this question, most of you considered it about your, your, your living body, you're standing here, you're sitting here in class, you're alive, your body's healthy, everything's in one place, it's all covered up by skin, right? Maybe property, maybe not. But Douglas gave us a question about cadavers, right? Cadavers are dead, right? Uh, dead people usually don't assert property rights. I guess they can, but they usually don't. But we're not talking here about cadavers either, that is a corpse. We're talking about something different, right? We're talking about a person who has life, who's alive, and then a doctor removes stuff from the body, takes cells out of the body, and then does stuff to those cells. And the question is, are those cells that are removed property? And number two, does that property still belong to the person? In other words, once the cells are removed, does the owner, the person, relinquish, you might say abandon, any property rights? And if the person abandons the property rights, does the doctor who extracted them obtain those property rights? Everyone see the question, right? Are the cells property? Do you keep the property interest after you extract it? And then does a the doctor then own that cell. All right, everyone with me. All right, Chris, 
So what happened here in the trial court, please? So the trial court sustained the defendant's demur. What the hell does that mean, sustained a demur? I hope some of you Google that. Basically, they're just saying that... Um, What's a demur? Like a plea, a plea that's kind of an objection, saying that they don't have a prima facie case. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Think of a demur as like a summary judgment motion, right? When they sustain a demur, that means basically granting summary judgment for the defendant. I don't know why it's called a demur. It's, it's in some states they have that. But when they say they sustain the defendant's demur, that means they granted summary judgment for the plaintiffs. I'm sorry, for the defendants, for the defendants, I'm sorry. They gave a judgment for the defendant. Okay, and then Chris, what happened on appeal with the California Court of Appeals? They reversed, saying that there was a cause of action for conversion. Yeah, that is what happened on appeal. Um, now, I wanna talk about this for a minute, right? Um, Mike, was there any sort of statute or regulation that the Court of Appeals relied on to find that this conversion cause of action worked? California Court of Appeals. Was there any statute they relied on? No. What's, how is conversion defined? Like, is there a statute for conversion, generally? Yes. But how did conversion develop originally? Where did conversion come from? Legislature? Common law. Common law. Who develops common law? judges right so what we have here is conversion it's a tort that's hundreds of years old right it's been around forever and the California Court of Appeals is adapting the conversion tort for a very modern and complicated context right they're taking an old common law tort and they're updating it Joe what does this remind you of that maybe we study but we take this sort of old concept and you apply it to sort of novel you know, technology. Acquisition of capture was applied to oil and gas. And what rules were they applying to it? What kind of? Um, uh, acquisition by capture of wild animals. Yeah. Remember those cases we did last week, right? Where the judges drew an analogy, right? Where the judges drew an analogy between wild animals and oil and gas. And I think we all sat there saying that's insane, right? Why on earth are we comparing, um, you know, the doctrines for hunting a whale or the hunting of a fox to oil spilling through the earth, right? It just doesn't make sense. But judges have this tendency to take old doctrines and simply insert modern facts to it. I think that's what the California Court of Appeals did here. They took an old doctrine, conversion, right? If I take your laptop or I take your, uh, uh, you know, book, that's conversion, right? So of course, if you take someone's cells, that's conversion. But that skips over some very thorny questions, right? There's no question that a book or a laptop is a piece of property, right? That it's, you can buy it, you can sell it, you can do whatever you want. But are cells property? Can you sell them? No, maybe it's not fully property, right? And second, even if you can sell property, isn't it removing it from your body and abandonment, right? Usually cells die once you take out the body. They can't exist outside the body. So how can you claim a right to something that you just killed? You've taken out of your body to destroy it, right? You can't survive after it. But the California Court of Appeals was willing to extend the conversion toward here. And they make a lot of, I think, moral judgments, which maybe you agree with, maybe you don't. And they say, this satisfies all the elements of a cause of action for conversion. And they recognize, though, their costs to treating cells as property, right? They say the evolution from slavery to freedom, from people as chattels to recognition of individual dignity, necessitates prudence. We got to be cautious. And they threw the caution away, right? <laughs> it's like, let's be cautious. No, we're not cautious, right? And we'll just declare. Well, they don't quite go so far. They say, we don't decide if human tissue ought to be a gift based on free market principles that can be sold. That's a policy question for the legislature. But all we ask for is whether you can have some sort of property ownership over your cells. And they say that Moore did not abandon his cells. The cell is a part of his person. Even though they're different cells, let me make this point clear. Let's say they took one cell from Mr. Moore. It made a million cells later, right? Those other cells were generated outside the body. So they weren't technically his, but they were like his like descendants, you want to say. I don't know what you want to call it, right? But they say the cells 
and the cells that result are part of his body. And therefore, judgment was given for more. Everyone understand the, the Court of Appeals decision? And I think the Court of Appeals recognizes that they're on some very shaky ground with saying, look, we know this is risky calling body parts property, because then we can call people property, that's just risky, but we're just assigning this one case. But they're not. Right? Courts aren't able to limit their ruling to a single issue. By definition, common law means you apply these rules in multiple contexts. Right? Common law courts can't limit themselves the way a legislature can. Right? A legislature could say, you know what? You can sell bone marrow, but you can't sell a kidney. They can draw that distinction, right? But courts can't. Courts don't have the power to limit the rulings in that fashion, because some other courts say, you know what? I think bone marrow and kidney should be sold for cash. So that's a danger when courts go down this road. And the California Supreme Court, they reversed, did not agree. And with a dissent, it was a dissent, don't get me wrong, it was not unanimous, but the California Supreme Court disagreed. Um, so Nancy, let's just start off and get the fiduciary duty out of the way. The majority opinion by Justice Pinelli. Uh, what was his opinion on the uh, fiduciary duty claim? Did the court hold that Dr. Gold violated this fiduciary duty? Um, I think so. You think yeah. so? You sure? I'm not sure. Well, what did the doctor tell Mr. Moore he was doing with his body parts, the cells? He said he was going to dispose of them. And what did he actually do? He processed them. So do you think that the doctor violated fiduciary yes. duty? There? Okay, that's right. He did. Right? So the court affirmed on fiduciary duty, said there was a breach of this duty. But, Nicholas, what's the remedy for a breach of fiduciary duty? What's the remedy for that claim? I mean, it would, it would be damages, but I mean, it would be significantly less than the conversion. D well, does he get a percentage of the cell line for fiduciary duty breach? No. Just for the, I guess, the harm caused specifically by that. Basically, the, the harm caused, which might have been, you know, the damage to go to the doctor, Right, maybe pain and suffering. We're talking thousands, not billions. Right, Jordan, what would the remedy be for a conversion claim? It would be, I guess, the value of whatever the property is taken. Yeah. In other words, let's just say, you know, I'll use an example. Let's say I have a milk cow, right? And you steal my milk cow and you make lots of milk, right? I don't want the buckets of milk because people already have to drink them, right? My measure of damage is I want the value of the milk that you sold. Right? That makes sense? Right? If you take my, you know, my, you know, my, 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 my coop of chickens, right? And then you slaughter them and you sell them for, for, for meat. I don't want the chickens back. They've all been slaughtered. I can't get it back. But I want the value of the chickens that you sold. Everyone just get the idea, right? That's a good example milk cow. Right? It's up for next year. Um, uh, <laughs> Chickens, chicken coop. Okay, I'll remember. All right. I, every year I think of different ways to explain things. Some work, some don't. I, I abandoned things, but this one is actually decent, right? So with conversion, the measure of damage is you want to, maybe not the entire value of the, of, the, of, the, of the cell line, right? Because a lot of work was put in by the engineers, by the scientists, et cetera. But you get some cut. So we're talking not thousands, but millions or billions, right? This guy would be, you know, he, you know he's, he's loaded, right? Um, so he put all of his eggs in the conversion claim. He did not want the fiduciary trust. So the fiduciary one was like, yeah, you win. You get some nominal damages, right? It's not going to be a lot, right? Maybe the doctor will like maybe get a suspension or like, lose his license or something. He doesn't care. He's, he's wealthy. It's just, it's whatever. So all the ball game here is on conversion, right? And whether this common law tort protected against interference with the guy's cells. OK, so Ashley. According to Moore, right, if you're Moore's lawyer, what's your argument? Just say you're pretending you're Moore's lawyer here. You're Moore's lawyer. What do you say? Well, if we're actually going to be trying, uh -huh. it's not just his, I mean, they're creating the environment for his cells to act as a generator. Okay, 
Okay, so if you're Moore's lawyer, do you think that, re that extracting the cells is a form of abandonment? If you're Moore's lawyer. Okay. If you're Moore's lawyer, do you think you retain ownership even after the cells are removed? Yeah, okay. So Moore's lawyer says that they're your cells even if they're taken out of your body. Okay? This is what's known, or there's a doctrine as abandonment, right? Where if I, you know, dump some garbage on the side of the road and I run away and I leave it there and I don't care anymore, you could argue that it's abandoned property. Someone else can come along and take it. Generally, you don't keep an interest in stuff that you abandon. But Moore argues that the rule is different for cells, that because of the nature of cells that they regenerate, you can't treat it like just trash you uh, put on the side of the road. It's something special. I wouldn't just get the argument for Moore. Now, Ryan, has any court ever adopted a conversion tort for human cells? Um, no, I don't think there's precedent dealing with. Yeah, I think, I think you said it well, right? No court has ever said there is conversion. Also, no court has ever said there's not conversion. So I guess it's an open issue, right? So Cassie, let me ask this question, please. Here we have a court sitting in the 1980s with a question of first impression. This is Pearson, right? This is the Fox case, my friends. What is a judge to do when they have no precedent finding persuasive? Awesome. This is the exact question I gave you guys about two weeks ago. What's a judge to do and there's no precedent. What did judges do? They could, well, whatever they want. Look at custom. Custom, okay. What might the custom be here? Is there like hunter gatherer uh, uh, practice of extracting cells? I suppose. I mean, you can look at how they, they, they control how they did it on like a, on the black market. Well, who's they? <laughs> what kind of custom? Well, after it's on the black market. Well, let's let's do a little bit off black market. What okay. what other customs might we consider? Not just you know organ harvesters. Who else might we consider? What their customs are? Uh, researchers. Doctors. Doctors. And what's the doctor custom here? The doctors usually provide compensation for the people for their cells. No. Nope. And in fact, the court mentions the Henry Lacks thing in their opinion. Right. The custom, as far as it goes is you don't give the patient a penny, right? That's what the custom is, right? The same way the custom of the hunters was you put the harpoon, wherever it was, right? Here, the custom is nothing to the patient. So if we resolve this one based on custom, Cassidy, has this case turn out? Nothing. Uh-huh, nothing for Mr. Moore. Amir, let me ask you a question, please. You're a judge confronted with no precedent, binding and persuasive. You could look to custom, okay, that's maybe possible. What else might you look for instead of custom? What other considerations might you take into factor? Things to do like um, polling, like public polling. Public polling, my God, that's great, right? That was just as handy, right? Can judges issue a poll saying, what do you think people, should we do this or not? Yeah, I, that, that, I think that's a good answer, right? You could, I mean, that, that'd be insane, but I guess courts put out a poll and ask people, what do you think? Now, now Amir, let me ask the follow-up, generally, if a majority of the state wants to do something, right, a majority of the state wants to take a certain action, what happens? No, 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 you're not answering my question. Generally, in, in most states, right, when a majority of a state wants to do something, what results from that majority? It's such an easy question, you're not seeing it. Carter? Legislature, my goodness. If the majority of the state want to do something, you change the damn law. Again, lawsuits are just, you, you, you grow up learning, oh, courts are the godsend. They save everything. You have legislatures, right? If this is popular enough that the poll, the majority of people want to do X, pass a bill. Let the governor sign it. Assign property rights for organs. But that hasn't happened. The people of California, at least in the 80s, hadn't reached a decision on this. There's no consensus. So I guess in the absence of that, they could do a poll, but there's still no consensus, right? Uh, Victor, let me ask this question. What else could a court do when confronted with no precedent one way or the other? What else could a court do? Like compare it to something similar. Um, oh. oh, yeah. So, or slavery or yeah, and, and, and so which opinion does that, do you think? 
There are two opinions, that, or a couple opinions you read. Uh, yeah, just Arabian. What does he say? He talks about prostitution. He mentioned those things. What does that mean in your own words? You're you read the exact right sentence. What does it mean in your own words? Um, that like a body is, I guess, holy. He just said scare quotes. If you, if you read it holy, if you couldn't see it, then very low, but I saw it. <laughs> the body is holy. Yeah, and it shouldn't be something that should be commodified. And he looks at abortion, right? He looks at prostitution. Um, this, I think, is the analogy, right? We ban prostitution. We ban different controls over people's bodies. We should not allow this, right? There are religious, moral, and philosophical values at stake. And we don't know what's going to happen if we recognize a property interest here, right? This is not for us to decide, for the legislature to decide, right? Uh, is it Nikki? Yes. Nikki, OK, give me another one, right? What else can a court do? if they are confronted with a case on which there's really no clear precedent. What else can they look to? You can try to like manipulate or like previous Previous what? Previous statutes. There are no statutes here, I'm telling you. Okay. Well, actually, okay, no, there actually there is. There is. What previous statute might you draw an inference from here? So they try to manipulate the... We say manipulate. I'm not sure what you mean. Maybe that's from getting lost. We mean manipulate. Ah, based on other laws. Yeah. Okay. So maybe say here, the legislature adopted these other laws, and we can draw an inference from these laws that they want to treat this similar this way, I'm sorry, this situation this way, and they'll treat that simulation a similar way. So what stats do they, do they draw from there, Nikki? Uh, they talk about the health and safety code, section 7, safety code, four. <laughs> Very good. What, what does that one say? Right, and so they basically say when you have this waste, destroy it. Does that seem to suggest it's something valuable that the person keeps after it leaves their body? Right. Now, I don't think you seem persuaded by this argument because it manipulates. It's a very strong word. I don't mean manipulate. I just mean that, like, they're trying Stretch, to maybe? Yeah, I'm saying Stretch. that it's not intrinsically related. So they're trying to be like, this is probably going to... Do you think there's a logical <laughs> argument? Do you think you can draw that inference? Yeah, I think you can make an argument, but I, I just don't agree with it. Okay, all right, yeah, fair point. Anna, what's another way, right? You're, you're a judge. You have this case. There's no precedent. <clears throat> One way or the other, bonding persuasive. What might you look to? Um, well, previous cases like the Manhattan Baker Hits Act, that's the one that's Yeah, so they signed Grotius here in Pufendorf? Yeah. No, did they sign Grotius in Pufendorf no, no, here? No, 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 they should have, maybe. I don't know. But what else What else might, well, I think it appears to be post, right? What were some of the reasons why the dissent gave the fox to the hunter? Okay, give me a little bit more. What, that labor's right, but why did they reward the hunter in the, the descent? They put in the work many times. And what were they worried would happen if they didn't reward the hunter? What would happen if they reward the jerk? It would probably set a precedent. And what would that precedent do? That you can get away with stuff. And what, what would the hunter, maybe, would the hunter change his course of actions? Yeah, probably. What would he, what, what would he stop doing? Okay. So in Pearson, the dissenter said, if we rule for the jerk, the hunter may decide, you know, this is not worth my time. Why am I going to waste my time hunting if I don't get it? Or use the whale case as an example, right? If you rule for the guy who found the whale on the beach, the hunter's like, screw this. Why am I going to risk my life going on a whale boat if some other person can take along? Like, what does the court consider here that's very similar to the dissent from Pearson? What, what sort of argument do you look at here? Majority opinion. What would happen if they ruled with Mr. Moore here? What would the consequence be of that ruling? Then you set a new like public outlook where people want to try to sell their stuff and medical research terms. 
Why would medical research tank? Because people would keep trying to sell their, their tissues. And Not just things. that. David, let me ask you this follow-up. Are, are everyone's cells valuable? No. Is it going to be rare that someone's cells are valuable? Yes. Do you know in advance if a person's cell is valuable is after you take it out? You do not know until they take it out. So under Moore's rule, what would have to happen when a person takes out cells? What do they have to get? Um, they would have to do something to determine whether they had any real value. No, no, no. What If Moore had his way, uh, what would happen before any cell cells extracted? Oh, there would have to be an agreement that if these cells are special, then we can get rid of them. Okay. <clears throat> if Moore is right, you would have to have an agreement in advance that any cells that are valuable, a cut, a percentage goes to the person. Sometimes it's not known for years if a cell line is valuable. And maybe it looks valuable, but then it turns out to not be valuable. Think of it this way. It will be so expensive to compensate every single person whose cells are extracted on the possibility that they might be useful. And then Stuart, what happens if it becomes very expensive to start extracting these cells. What does that do to medical research? It starts to deter research yeah. progression. Very good. It punishes researchers. It makes it less profitable. And the courts worried that they rule for Mr. Moore, doctors will not invest the time and labor, labor theory, they will not invest the time and labor into researching if they're going to have to then give up a huge chunk of their uh, profits to a bunch of random people who gave some blood. What if you combine cell lines of different people? Right? The court says imposing a duty would affect medical research. That's important to all society. So you remember the question here. Who will you say, is that fair? Fair to whom? Fair to the individual, Mr. Moore? Or fair to society as a whole? that people can benefit from this cancer treatment, right? If you were someone who benefited from this cancer, you're not going to care much about Mr. Moore, right? So fair to whom? This is Pearson, right? This is Pearson v. Post. And that's why I like that case at the start of the semester. Much more complicated facts, but the reasoning's the same. You have no precedent. What then is the basis for your ruling? Fairness for society as a whole, right? As a result, they reject the argument of conversion, right? It's wrong to impose liability for conversion. They say policy counsels against extending the tort. This issue is better suited for legislator to resolve. And you don't need conversion to protect patients' rights. You can use fiduciary duty claims, right? They don't want to threaten liability for doctors. Uh, Marissa, let me ask you a question. If the court imposes liability for Mr. Moore, what happens to other people who've had their cells extracted over the years? Yep, there's no statute of limitation because the cells keep growing, 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 growing. Is it even possible, Marissa, to recover these billions of dollars that have probably been spent already on other things? No. I mean, just think of it this way, right? If billions of dollars have been paid out, they're spent to manufacturers, distributors, pharmaceuticals, right? That money doesn't just exist in some sort of like, like pot. It would be almost impossible to have pharmaceutical companies going bankrupt to pay this off because they didn't expect to give Mr. Moore half whatever the number happens to be. And how do you even know what the value is? Like what cut does Mr. Moore get? I, I think about this often. What would the, for Marcos, what would the number be? I mean, how would you even calculate what cut is his of the, of the, of the profits? It would be nearly impossible to keep track of how many people have been helped or how much has been sold. Yeah. Because the thing about these lines is they regenerate, and you can transfer them, and people can make their own. I, I think nearly impossible is a good word to use, Marcos. I don't think it can be done. I've thought of this. How would you even quantify this amount? It's such a complicated number. The court just said, not for us. I'm sorry, Mr. Moore. You got screwed. Maybe the legislature can figure this out. Right? OK. Um, is that a hand? Kaylee? Is it no? You thinking? How about, I'll call Anthony and come back to you, okay? I don't know what you just said. What, Anthony? Couldn't they have just made the ruling proactive instead of retroactive? Can courts do that? So, I 
allow them. I know, but can courts make a, pr a perspective ruling that's not retroactive? Can they say, I mean, look, if the if the if the conversion tort includes this, then the conversion tort included it seven years ago, right? It's not now. Courts do sometimes limit the rulings prospectively. I don't know that that's correct, but the, the, the courts sometimes do that. So it's a good thought. But it's very strange. Say, here's the rule. The tort. This is what the tort means, but it only means it going forward, right? That's that's what legislatures do, not courts. Generally, most court decisions or many court decisions are retroactive. They don't have to be retroactive, but generally they are. Yeah. Yeah, Lexi. So you're saying people will now be motivated to donate their cells, see if they're valuable, and at the outset determine if they're worth reproducing? Is that what you're saying? Maybe. Possibly. I mean, the upshot here is once you create monetary incentives, you would create a market to who has the best cells, right? Mr. Moore only got tested by fluke chance because he had a 25 pound spleen, right? It wasn't, it was, this wasn't anticipated. So maybe people can just do a, you know, a, a diagnostic saying, wow, you have awesome cells, come sell them to us. So I, if the court went the other way, um, you could probably figure a way around it. The market is very powerful. Markets find ways. Markets always find a way. So I'm sure you, if the court ruled this way and they signed a property right, the market would have found a way. Yes, Caitlin. Okay, thank you. Um, so going off kind of what she's saying, um, I don't know, we're talking about fairness and like to, to whom it would be fair to or whatever. And I don't know, I almost kind of find it laughable that it's unfair to research when the biggest, one of the biggest economies in the world, arguably, is the pharmaceutical company and the medical industry, and they've got billions and billions of dollars that they're profiting off of the people that they're going to need to make sales off of by inflating the prices. And why shouldn't they have to give free compensation for this? I mean, they're making these executives these big billion dollar buyouts, even when they haven't declared bankruptcy. Like, why has that been quote unquote fair? If anything, I feel like that's a complete disadvantage. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I, th I think the court would agree with the position you criticize. I think the court would say that they, uh, these companies do create a social value that's worth protecting. Yeah, Chance? At the same time, they have that policy in there. We don't want to allow people to recover for themselves because at the end of the day, greater good, right? Right. Uh, the idea is the, the pharma company is perhaps they're not the best social citizens, but they create a greater good. I think that's probably what the judges would say in the majority. On the flip side of that, though, because you have this case and you can't make a, and there hasn't been a legislative decision, to my knowledge, if you had someone that's saying, hey, their cells didn't regenerate, but their cells held the secret to not curing uh, um, cancer or something like that, could they then go, well, look, sorry to tell you this, we have a case here. That's my property. I'm going to hold the whole world that has cancer ransom because you can't take it without. Right, I mean, uh, there's a flip side to that, Caitlin. I, I don't want to respond um, directly, but if Mr. Moore now has monopoly over cells, he could extract a very high price <laughs> over cells that are very valuable. So I indeed, giving a single person this sort of unilateral monopoly could shift who the billionaires. Maybe he should be the billionaire by virtue of, the, of, his, of, his, of nature. But the, the, the holdup of giving one person the right to show the licenses is significant. Right? I mean, you don't think about this, but like, um, uh, you know, the happy birthday to you song, right? We all sing it. There was a dispute over whether there was a copyright on it, right? And someone said, I have the copyright, and you can't all wish someone happy birthday to that song because that's my song. So when, when one person or the other is holding a, a, a monopoly on some sort of property, it deprives all of us the, the, the ability to control its usage. Isn't that the same with the big monopoly on insulin and people having trouble buying insulin because it's so high price? Yeah, someone's, okay. so, uh, someone holds monopoly, right? Whenever anyone holds a monopoly, they can control its distribution. Chris? The tragedy of the anti commons. Oh, well, God, you're good. How do you know about the tragedy of the anti commons? Is that, you read about that? Yeah. Tell us about it. So Most people skip that part. The tragedy of the commons, just to illustrate the adverse, the tragedy of the commons says that when there's property owned in common, then you 
if it needs to be exported or used so right. as quickly as possible. So the, the trash in the commons is like, you know, you're in a forest and there's only so many animals to hunt and you have several people hunting for the same animals, so it's going to be a rage to kill as many animal, anim animals as you can because there's no incentive to be saved. So that's the tragedy of the commons, right? Where you just race to the bottom. That was the tragedy of the anti-commons. The opposite is the tragedy of the anti-commons in which one person or one group of persons holds something that is valuable. And when they hold that, it is sense of depriving the society from the benefits that right. accrue if that was, um, if more people had access to it. Right, so in this case, if one person owns a cell line, he's gonna deprive everyone else because he's the most deprived of rights. I, I feel bad for Mr. Moore, and I feel, you know, it, I, as an empathic person, I think he got the short end of the stick, to put it mildly, but his cells are not valuable without the labor of these researchers and doctors. So, right. it, and, yeah. that in and of itself. So that raises the question, but that's the question with the Marcos, right? What's the split? 99 to 1, 75 to 25, right? What's the value of the labor added and what's the value of the cells you're born with? Right? How do you divide that up? I think he would take a 1% cut. A 1% yeah. of a billion is still a lot of money. Yeah. Right, that, 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 that's, that's still a lot of money. Yeah, Chance. And then, oh, actually, you know, Kelsey and then Chance, please. Okay. Um, so this court has said a lot that they want the legislature to kind of make a final call on this. Yeah. So as precedent, can this really be like the end all be all? So like if somebody had this same similar thing, like if Henrietta happened in 2020, and like she finds out she's got these crazy cells that her doctor finds out can cure whatever, is this case going to bar her from any sort of recovery? In or California, yes. In California, but like if the legislator, I don't know, in Texas was like, like they had the made a decision. Can, the legislature can say we want this to for its own. Nothing stopping the legislature from enacting a statute. But like the Texas Supreme Court could take the same set of facts and do something different with it. So it's not like it's barred forever. Uh, it forever. Yeah. Uh, Chance, and then I want to do the dissent. It would have made sense to know her, what her view is to say, hey, open the market up and let the market determine damages. If you start seeing all the companies coming to those that you know, agreement with individuals at 1%, 5%, 20%, that, wouldn't that be a reasonable measure of damage? Depending on the value. If you're still alive. Just, just want to raise your hand in response. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, if you're saying I that's just, I'm a long-term... I, I have one rule, just if you want to speak, raise your hand. Just keep things civil. Yeah, go ahead. Trevor knows that one. Okay. The, uh, I, I just think that, I mean, in theory, that sounds good, but, you know, if you have to wait to calculate your damages on something like that and see how the market, as science, you know, improves and they're still using your cells, you're, mm -hmm. you're dead. All right. Uh, is that Julie's? Uh, Julie's said, let's go to dissent. So what does the dissent say in this case? Just as Monk. Um, so it basically says that um, Moore's body and his cells were exploited, and it kind of relates it to slavery, and that using in this region, using it for their benefit. OK, very good. The dissent describes property in terms of this bundle of rights, which is the, remember the bundle of sticks I mentioned a few minutes ago, right? The bundle of sticks. And the same bundle of rights does not attach all forms of property, right? Some, some property you can sell but not give away, right? So, for example, uh, if you're about to declare bankrupt, people often try and give away their property so it doesn't, um, what do you call it? It doesn't uh, uh, count towards their, their assets, right? You can sell stuff before bankruptcy because that's money that can be recovered against you but you can't give it away. So you'll see sometimes, this happens as well, when a person's about to get divorced, they give away their property to friends for very cheap prices, and they sell it back after the divorce is final. So that way it's not included in the divorce, right? That's actually considered a form of fraud, right? You can't convey property in anticipation of cheating someone else out of it. Um, there's some property they can give away but not sell. So for example, fish and game, right? When you hunt, you can give away game you catch, but perhaps you can't sell it. Um, and there are some things that you can't buy or sell or give, like a law license. You can't sell your law license. It's something you have, you earned it, but you can't transfer it. 
And they say that this bundle exists with different attributes. So even if you perhaps can't sell the cells in your body, the descent says, perhaps you should be able to profit from the cells when they are outside of your body. And indeed, the court finds an ethical imperative that we have to prevent abuse and exploitation of people like Mr. Moore. Right? We shall we should allow people to pay for things in which they're exploited for. All right. They say there's fundamental fairness, unjust enrichment. There's not a, a, a there's an unequal bargaining status, and Moore gets Zippo, nothing. Right. Then the court says the legislature may be competent to act, but that doesn't mean the courts can't act now. You'll see this argument a lot, right? When you read in a, a con law next term a decision involving a same-sex marriage called the Burgerfell, uh, Justice Kennedy has one opinion where he says, uh, "We need not wait when fundamental rights are at stake," which is a lovely phrase. Basically saying we don't have to wait; we can do it on our own, guys. We got this. Right or wrong? They're saying we can we can act here. We don't have to pause. Think of this Splunking Explorer, right? We have to resolve this. We can't just say nothing, right? The guy's about to be hanged. Okay. And the dissent also says that the breach of the duty tort is not adequate. It's not adequate. Why? Because the damages are very low, right? And the informed consent laws doesn't go nearly far enough to protect. The value of the, of the of the cells. Okay. Yes, Tim. Maybe, maybe a better example is like a forest, right? You can work someone's forest is not exact. You convert a forest, and the trees grow every year in new timber. Or maybe you convert a farm, and every year the um, the farm grows and creates some vegetables, right? You guys are better timber than cows. The cows die, but 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 the plants and vegetables they can regenerate. I don't. I honestly, I don't know what the measure of damages. I think the court's probably afraid of that that they were not going to deal with this. And even the dissent doesn't really explain how you would do it. It's like, oh, well, we're mad. Let the trial court figure it out. Yeah, good luck with that. But what happens is they would settle, right? There's no way a pharma company would let us go to a jury. This would be insane. I mean, it's just, uh, there, there's no way they would just settle it out and make it go away. I think it's always. Oh, yes, uh, Nancy. So then how, uh, maybe I don't understand the patent um, rights then, but how then can the doctor have a patent on this cell line. I know he developed that, but then can't more go to another doctor and say, do you want my magic cells too? And they create their own line, then is um, that something? Yeah, he could, right? And I don't know if he did, but in theory, more can go to another doctor. Um, but let me just make this point a little bit clearer. If I just, if more went to another doctor and extracted the cells, it wouldn't be as valuable. Gold right. did stuff to the cells to make them useful. And it was that additional labor that makes them valuable. It's not just cells. So in other words, in order for more cells to be valuable, some other doctor would have to do the same thing more did, and that's what patented. Right? The process of conversion of the cells is what's the protected. Process that's protected. Right. It, okay. It's not just, not just the cells themselves, it's the process of modifying the, the, the cells to regenerate in a specific fashion. So if someone else was given the exact same cells that Moore has, 